to how the conspiracy was developed in America Professor John Robeson has been smeared and his books have been burned by Agent Euler of the Synagogue of Satan because he proved himself to be incorruptible. He refused to help Weishaupt and his Luciferians infiltrate Illuminism into Freemasonry. History proves, however, that what he did write and publish regarding the conspiracy to destroy all governments and religions has turned out to be true. Robeson tells us that before 1786, when the Bavarian government exposed Weishaupt and his gang, several Masonic lodges in America had been Illuminized. He also points out the similarities of the American and succeeding French revolutions. We have been ridiculed by some influential people for quoting Professor Robeson, evidently to shake the confidence of our readers. In support of our statements we give the following documentary evidence, most of which can be confirmed by simply referring to the National Archives in Washington, D.C. in 1798. David A. Tappan was president of Harvard University. On July 19th of that year, he addressed a graduating class in the chapel at Harvard College. He warned America's future leaders of the dangers of Illuminism, which he said had infiltrated into America. He told them of the influence of the Illuminati used to bring about the French Revolution. That same year, 1798, Timothy Dwight was president of Yale. He gave Americans much the same warning in a paper entitled, The Duty of Americans in the Present Crisis. By the time Pike entered the university as a student, Harvard was being brought under the control of the Illuminati.25. Also, in 1798 Jedediah Morse preached his Thanksgiving Day sermon on the Illuminati and their Masonic affiliations. Still in the same year, John Wood exposed the Clintonian faction of the Society of Columbian Illuminati. In 1799, John Cozens Ogden wrote an article, A View of New England Illuminati, who are indefatigably engaged in destroying religion and government in the United States under a feigned regard for their safety. There were, as recently as 1957, in the Rittenhouse Square Library in Philadelphia, three letters written by John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, to call W.M. Lucifer Stone, a Knight Templar and editor of the New York Advertiser. These letters were very critical of Thomas Jefferson and the manner in which he had subverted Freemasonry in the New England states. Adams knew of what he was writing, because he had been mainly responsible for organizing the lodges into which Jefferson infiltrated his Illuminati. Adams gives as his reason for running against Jefferson for the presidency, Jefferson's subversiveness. The letters he wrote call. Stone are credited with defeating Jefferson. Adams listed five main objections to Illuminism as being proselyted by Jefferson and his fellow Illuminists. 1. Their teachings are contrary to the law of the land. 2. They are in violation of the precepts of Jesus Christ. 3. They require members to take a pledge to keep undefined secrets, the nature of which is unknown to the man taking the oath. 4. They require a member to express his willingness to suffer death should he violate his oath. 5. They require a member to say he will accept a mode of death which is unusual, inhuman, and so cruel that the details are unfit for utterance from human lips. Then, in 1826, an incident happened which should prove to Freemasons themselves that only members who have been carefully selected are permitted to know anything of what goes on in the secret society which Illuminists organize within their own secret society. It is therefore as reasonable to condemn as inhuman and diabolical a person suffering from cancer, as it is to blame the rank and file of secret societies, orders, and organizations and groups for the sins against God and crimes against humanity committed by the synagogue of Satan who infiltrate their agent or into the secret societies. 
It would be better for the world if there were no secret societies, because those who direct the WRM at the top would then be unable to practice their parasitic policy and place the blame for their devilish actions upon shoulders other than their own. The incident we refer to concerns Captain W.M. Morgan, who was accused of breaking his oath. The Illuminist influence within Masonry's top executive insisted that Morgan be given the death, the manner of which Adams had been so disgusted and critical. A Mason named Richard Howard was selected as executioner. Morgan got warning of his pending fate. He tried to escape to Canada, but got only as far as Niagara Falls, where Howard murdered him. According to Cowell Stone, the Knight Templar to whom Adams had written the letters referred to above, Howard resumed to New York and reported to a meeting of the Knight Templars at St. John's Hall, New York, how he had executed Morgan. Stone says he was then supplied with money and put aboard a ship bound for 25 Harvard has remained under the influence of internationalist-minded men ever since, as explained in Red Fog Over America, by W.G. Carr, page 80 Satan, Prince of this World Liverpool, England. Stone's statements are published in his Letters on Masonry and Anti-Masonry. What Stone exposed regarding Morgan is confirmed in an affidavit taken by Avery Allen when he seceded from the Knights Templar of New Haven, Connecticut. He swore that Richard Howard had confessed himself to have been the executioner of Morgan. Masonic records prove that when these repulsive facts became known in Masonic circles, a terrific reaction set in. Approximately 1,500 lodges in the United States surrendered their charters. It is estimated that of the 50,000 Masons belonging to these lodges, 45,000 seceded from the secret society. Thus it was that Freemasonry nearly died a natural death in America. But such is the power and influence of the synagogue of Satan that today hardly a mason with whom I have discussed this phase of their history knows anything about it. I have copies of the minutes taken at the meetings which led up to this mass withdrawal from masonry in America. These truths are not published to hurt Freemasons, but to prove conclusively that out of a possible 50,000 Masons, at least 45,000 didn't know or even suspect what goes on behind the scenes under the direction of Satanists who hide like worms in the bowels of their and other secret societies. Those who serve the SOS decided a native-born must succeed Moses Holbrook, who at the time these events happened had a masonry in America, so General Albert Pike was approached. He measured up to the requirements because his rise from an initiate in 1850 to Grand Commander of the Supreme Council for the Southern Jurisdiction of Freemasonry in the USA in 1859 was phenomenal. Pike's task was to rejuvenate Freemasonry in the USA so that the influence, wealth and power of its members could be used again by the Illuminati to place their agent or in key positions in all fields of human endeavor, including politics and religion. Today, as in 1826, the vast majority of Freemasons don't know about the secret life of Albert Pike. They have been lied to and deceived by Satan's agents into believing Pike to be the greatest Mason that ever lived, and one of America's greatest patriots. But they are wrong, as we prove Pike was literally a devil incarnate. Because the Illuminati had been proved to have corrupted Freemasonry in America, Pike decided to organize the Polydian Rite to be above even Grand Orient Masonry and the Illuminati. Paul Addison was writ exactly a new secret society, so Pike called his organization, the New and Reformed Paladian Rite, NRPR. Giuseppe Mattazzini had been selected by the Illuminati in 1834 to be their director of political action, director of the WRM. 
In a letter Mazzini sent to Pike January 22, 1870, he wrote, We must allow all the Federation of different Masonic orders to continue just as they are, with their systems, their central authorities and their diverse modes of correspondence between high grades of the same right, organized as they are at present, but we must create a supreme right, which will remain unknown, to which we will call those Masons of high degree whom we shall select. With regard to their brothers in Masonry, these men must be pledged to the strictest secrecy. Through this supreme right we will govern all Freemasonry, which will become the one international center, the more powerful because its directions, directors, will be unknown. This letter proves that not even Mazzini, at the time he wrote the letter, knew the high priests of the Luciferian creed controlled the synagogue of Satan, of which he was a member, at the top but after working a while longer with Pike, he began to suspect there was some secret power above or beyond the highest degrees of Grand Orient Masonry, of which he was a member, which controlled them at THETOP. He expressed these suspicions in the letter he wrote Dr. Bridenstine, already quoted. Pike and Mazzini signed the decree for the constitution of a central high masonry, September 20th, 1870. This was the day the Grand Orient Mason, General Caderna, entered Rome to end the temporal power of the Pope. Pike assumed the title of Sovereign Pontiff of Universal Freemasonry. Mazzini assumed the title Sovereign Chief of Political Action, i.e., head of the World Revolutionary Movement, WRM. Pike immediately proceeded to complete the work on the new ritual he had started with Moses Holbrook, and he called it, the Adonai Aside Mass, the Death of God, Margiata, a 33rd degree Mason, who wrote Masonic History, and the biography of Adriano Lamy, who in 1873 succeeded Mazzini as director of the WRM, has this to say regarding Pike and Mazzini. It was agreed that the existence of this right would be kept strictly secret, and that no mention of it would ever be made in the assemblies and inner shrines of other rites, even when by accident the meeting might happen to be composed exclusively of brothers having the perfect initiation, for the secret of the new institution was only to be divulged with the greatest caution to a chosen few belonging to the ordinary high grades. This explains why even 32nd and 33rd degree Freemasons know so little about what goes on at the very top. Margiata also states that 33rd degree members of the Scottish Rite are carefully selected for initiation into the Paladian Rite because of their extensive international ramifications. 33rd degree Masons are specially privileged to visit and take part in the rituals of other Masonic lodges throughout the world. Those who become members of Paladism recruit others. That is why the Supreme Rite created its triangles, the name, Page 81 Satan, Prince of this world given Paladian councils by degrees. These are established on a firm basis. The lowest of the initiates are brothers long tested in ordinary masonry, and proved to have defected from God and Christianity. Margiot adds, One will better understand these precautions knowing that Paladism is essentially a Luciferian rite. Its religion is Manichae Neonosticism, teaching that the divinity is dual, and that Lucifer is the equal of Adonai, with Lucifer the god of light and goodness struggling for humanity against Adonai the god of darkness and evil. 26. As Lucifer's sovereign pontiff on earth, Pike was the president of the Supreme Dogmatic Directory, assisted by ten ancients of the Supreme Council of the Grand Orient. Pike's Supreme Grand College of Emeritus Masons, Paula Diane Wright, accepted the Adonai Aside Mass, sometimes referred to as the Black Mass, as the ritual for the new and reformed Paula Diane Wright. Mazzini was sent a copy of the ritual. He was high in his praise of Pike, as his articles published in 
La Roma del Popolo, prove. With these preliminaries completed, Pike and his assistants organized with a supervisory triangle, or council, in Rome, Italy, to direct the WRM in all its many phases. He placed Mazzini in charge. After Mazzini's death, he made Lemmy supreme director. Pike organized another supervisory council in Berlin. He called it the Supreme Dogmatic Directory. It was kept functioning by means of a constantly renewed committee of seven, selected from the Supreme Council, Grand Encampments, Grand Orients, and Grand Lodges of the World. Two delegates looked after propaganda and finance. The director of propaganda was also director of intelligence, keeping the other two supervisory directors and the sovereign pontiff fully informed regarding important news and events gathered into the central clearing house. From the millions of pairs of eyes which their agent your control throughout the world, they boast that not even a minor piece of legislation can be put through any parliament without them having full knowledge of it and giving approval. The financial agent draws up a general balance sheet of all rights, in all countries, working with an accountant as a sworn expert under his orders. Under the sovereign directory in Charleston, South Carolina, and the executive of political action in Rome, and the administrative dogmatic council in Berlin come the 23 grand central directories which are bureaus or councils established in Europe, Asia Africa, Oceania, and North and South America. And above all these, the synagogue of Satan the high priests of the Luciferian creed rule invisible, unidentified, and supreme. When the League of Nations was first organized, 1919, Pike's organization was slightly revised, and the supervisory, executive, and administrative branches were established in Switzerland and New York. But it doesn't matter where the brains are located, they have perfect communication systems, and they control and direct all other subversive organizations and activities. That control and direction are the same today as in Pike's lifetime and at the time the League of Nations was formed. The same conspirators who formed and developed those, also developed the UNO please don't take my word for it. St. Paul, in 2 Corinthians 11 13 told us, for such false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing not to be wondered at if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose ends shall be according to their works. Let us pull aside the veil with which Pike enshrouded himself still further. I am aware that Dr. Batte, author of Le Diable O X L X E C I C L, has been accused of publishing a statement as facts on various occasions, but that does not mean he was always lying and publishing untruths. What he has to say regarding Pike and his occultism on page 360 of the above publication is confirmed in Occult Theocracy on page 223, written by Lady Queensborough. Further confirmation is to be found in the Masonic Library in Charleston, South Carolina. That Pike believed in occultism is proved by the fact that there is on record a report of the speech he made before the Supreme Council of the Grand Orient, Charleston, South Carolina, October 20, 1884, at which time he said, At St. Louis, we operated the Grand Rites, and through Sister Ingersoll, who was a first-class medium, received astonishing revelations during a solemn Palladian session at which I presided, assisted by Brother Friedman and Sister Warren Borden. Without putting Sister Ingersoll to sleep, we saturated her with the spirit of Ariel himself, but Ariel took possession of her with 329 more spirits of fire, and the seance from then on was marvelous. Sister Ingersoll, lifted into space, 
floated over the assembly, and her garments were suddenly devoured by a flame which enfolded her without burning her. We saw her thus in a state of nudity for over ten minutes, flitting above our heads as though borne by an invisible cloud, or upheld by a beneficent spirit, she answered all questions put to her. We thus had the latest news of our very illustrious brother Adriano Lemmy then Astaroth, in person, revealed himself, flying beside our medium, and holding her hand. He breathed upon her, and her twenty-six. We wonder what the R.T. Han, John Diefenbaker, Prime Minister of Canada, and the Han, Leslie Frost, Premier of Ontario, Canada's largest and richest province, have to say about this. In our monthly newsletter, NBN, October, issue, 1958, we published the fact that they both were initiated into the 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite in Windsor, Ontario, September 9, 1958. Page 82 Satan, Prince of this World Clothes returning from nowhere, clothed her again. Finally, Astaroth vanished, and our sister fell gently onto a chair, where, with her head thrown back, she gave up Ariel and the 329 spirits who had accompanied him. We counted 330 exhalations in all at the end of this experience. Pikes claimed that he was able to talk with Lemmy, his director of political action located in Italy during a seance held in St. Louis, caused me to do some further digging. I knew that those conducting seances often resorted to fake right to deceive those in attendance into believing they had supernatural powers. This research produced documentary evidence which strongly indicated that scientists belonging to Pike's Polidi and Wright had supplied him with wireless sets, radio, long before Marconi made it available for commercial purposes. I had always wondered why Marconi was given such strong opposition when he tried to make his discovery available to the general public. Investigation indicates that the opposition originated with men who had been closely associated with Pike prior to his death in 1891. In the background of the opposition was Gallatin Mackay, who succeeded Pike as head of Universal Masonry and Paul Adism. Documentary evidence exists which records Pike's ability to contact and speak with the heads of his supervisory councils regardless of where they happen to be located. He always used a code. He referred to the box he used while conducting these conversations as Arcula Mystica, the magic box. Obviously he and the heads of his 26 councils were connected together by wireless radio long before Marconi made his discoveries. There's evidence to prove that Pike's set did pass to Gallatin Mackay after he died. Therefore it is likely Pike used wireless telegraphy during the seances he directed in St. Louis. Pike and his supervisory directors of the WRM, Paladian Councils, all used code names, as had Weishaupt and his head Luminous before him. Pike and his Supreme Council in Charleston was known as Ignis, the code word for sacred fire, or divine endeavor, the code word for the supervisory council in Rome was ratio, meaning reason shall triumph over superstition. In Berlin the supervisory council's code name was labor. It is interesting to note that the head of the Berlin council, and the one in control of the Paladian treasury during Pike's time, was Gerson Bleitroder, a man who has been proven to be one of the highest and most trusted agents of the House of Rothschild. It is obvious that while Pike was high priest of the Luciferian ideology, and thus controlled the activities of the synagogue of Satan, the Rothschilds, through Bleitroder, controlled the purse strings of the Paladian Rite. Thus, they indirectly controlled Pike's activities as they had those of Weishaupt a hundred years before. This information proves that the present Rothschilds believe in the advice passed down to them by one of their ancestors.
Give me control of a country's money, and I care not who makes its laws. Another interesting fact is that both the Rothschilds and the Blythroders are, as Christ put it, them who say they are Jews, and are not, and do lie. They are Khazars. Their veins contain no more real Jewish blood than do mine. Research proves that Blythroder belonged to the highest degrees of the Polydian Rite and of Grand Orient Masonry, and must therefore have been a Satanist. During Pike's reign as Prince of this World under Satan's inspiration, his directors in England were Lord Palmerston and Disraeli, who told his readers that the masses, go him, don't realize that the real power which governs them in their country remains invisible and directs from behind the visible governments. Although Pike is credited with having ended Jewish control of Freemasonry in America, research proves that on September 12, 1874 he signed an agreement with Armand Levi, who represented the Jewish B'nai B'rith of America, Germany, England and other countries. Under this agreement Pike gave Levi authority to organize the Jewish Freemasons in those countries into a secret federation, to be known as the Sovereign Patriarchal Council. Its international headquarters were set up in a big building on Valentinskampstrasse, Hamburg, Germany. There is documentary evidence to show that the head of this secret federation collected in fees approximately $250,000 a year, which money was used mostly for payment of propaganda favorable to secularism. It is safe to say that the lesser Jew doesn't know any more about what is going on behind the scenes. Among those who control Judaism A-T-T-H-E-T-O-P, then do Masons up to the 33rd degree, or the vast majority of the Goyim. It is obvious, therefore, that in the final stage of the conspiracy all lesser beings will find themselves in the devil's stew pot. We are all intended to be simmered down in the devil's brew.27 in the hope of bringing order out of chaos, and united humanity in the service of God against Lucifer, I wish to point out once more that the struggle going on in this world is for the eternal possession of the souls of men. God wants us to prove that we wish to love him and desire to serve him voluntarily for all eternity. Lucifer is determined that his agents on this earth will take away from us our God-given gifts of an intellect and free will, so we will be unable to make this decision. Lucifer by use of Satanism, is determined to capture out immortal souls, not because he doesn't know that he was wrong, and that his totalitarian ideology will end in turmoil and chaos, but because he just can't stand to see other souls happy. He is determined that as many as possible will share his eternal misery. If the present revolutionary movement didn't extend into the celestial world, and eternity, but was confined to this world only, there would be no sense in risking exposure, imprisonment and even premature death. If everything ends with death, as atheists would have us believe, then why put ourselves out furthering a plot or plan we will not live to see accomplished? Page 83 Satan, Prince of this World Pike's Military Blueprint, as given to Magazini and passed on to Lemmy was as simple as it proved effective. Using the 26 triangles, or councils of the Polydian Rite, those who direct the WRM at the VERYTOP were to foment three world wars and three major revolutions. These were to be so directed that all remaining governments would be reduced to such a state of weakness and economic ruin that the people would clamor for world government as the only solution to their many and varied problems. After three global wars and two major revolutions, the United States would remain the only world power, but, during the third revolution which Pike said would be the greatest social cataclysm the world has ever known, the United States was to be disintegrated by internal treachery, 
and fall into the hands of the Luciferian conspirators, like overripe fruit. Pike set forth quite clearly that World War I was to enable the directors of the WRM to subjugate Russia and turn that empire into the stronghold of atheistic communism. This was accomplished with the first major revolution in 1917. Communism and Nazism were to be used together with anti-Semitism, to enable the directors of the WRM to foment World War II. This was to end with the destruction of Nazism as a world power, because it would, by then, have served its purpose. The sovereign state of Israel was to result from World War II, as was also the United Nations. Political Zionism was to be used to enable the directors of the WRM to foment World War III by playing up the real and supposed differences between Israel and the Arab states. World War II was to end with communism taking over control of most of the Far East. Sufficient territory was to be kept free so that communism in Russia and China could be kept in check, or contained until the synagogue of Satan were ready to use it in the final stage of the Luciferian conspiracy. Communism was to be organized and also kept in check in all the remaining nations until the directors of the WRM decided it was time to throw all communists and all non-communists at each other's throats. Pike explained all this to Mazzini in his letter dated August 15, 1871. This program has been carried out exactly as Pike intended. He simply applied his military genius to put Adam Weishaupt plans into effect. Thus the people on this planet are involved in the semi-final phase of the Luciferian conspiracy. After Pike died, Mackay took over. He, as did Lam Mi, considered that all the executive members of the Grand Orient Lodges and the councils of the new and reformed Paladian Right should be given special instructions in regard to the WRM. They were told in a series of lectures 1. What Weishaupt's revised plans called for. 2. How the World Revolutionary Movement had progressed since 1776. 3. The purpose of political intrigue going on at the time, i.e., 1889-1903. 4. What was intended should happen to bring the conspiracy to its successful conclusion, a one-world government the powers of which they would usurp. The lectures were prepared by Pike or writers who had been inspired by Pike's revolutionary ardor. These lectures were delivered by high-degree members of the Paladian Right, over a period of days, or nights, to gatherings of selected adepts who met in the lodges of the Grand Orient or New Paladian Right throughout the world. It was a copy of these lectures, slightly altered to give them a Zionist touch, which fell into the hands of Professor Satan, Nihilus, and which he published as the Jewish Peril. There is plenty of evidence available to prove these lectures were being delivered as early as 1885. As invariably happens, despite the greatest security precautions, information regarding the delivery of these lectures, and their purpose, to develop a conspiracy to the final social cataclysm, leaked out. The plot to develop the world revolutionary movement to its final state, as explained by Pike to Mazzini in his letter dated August 15, 1871, was discussed by several publications, two of which were, Le Plodisme, by Margiata, p. 186, published in 1895, and Le Diable Oxixiet, published in 1896. The lectures in their entirety were published by the Russian newspaper Moskowski Jawido Mosti during the winter of 1902-1903, and again by the Russian newspaper Snamja in August of 1903. The point I am trying to make in this, the first meeting of the learned elders of Zion to discuss political Zionism, as we know it today, took place in Basel. Switzerland, in 1897. 
The origin of the Luciferian conspiracy dates back to before Zionism was even mentioned in the Bible. The first series of lectures are in no way different from Weishaupt's revised version of the plot as exposed in 1786. How the plot was developed from Lucifer is concerned only with capturing souls. He doesn't care if they be the souls of Jews or Gentiles, colored folk or white folk. The fable of the Messianic Age is just as much of a disaphon to enlist Jews to serve the cause of Lucifer as is the dream of one-worlders that they will form a government when the first world government is established. Roosevelt honestly believed he was going to be the first king despot. He was disillusioned when Stalin double-crossed him after Yalta. How did he got fooled? To get our sights on the real target, we have to elevate the barrels of our rifles above the materialistic images which, like a mirage, reflect something beyond the range of our naked eyes. Let Christians believe what Christ and the scriptures tell us Luciferianism is the root of all evil. Satanism is the name by which most people know Luciferianism on this earth. Page 84 Satan Prince of this world 1786 to 1886 is told in the second series of lectures, and in no way differs from lectures delivered by Pike and his top officials between 1870 and 1886. Page 85 Satan, Prince of this